Hey everyone, welcome back to TheClinicalTrialsGuru.com. Again, it's TheClinicalTrialsGuru.com. This is Dan. We have Don who will be sitting right here. He will be joining us soon. It's not this guy back there. That's a <laughs> glass. Uh, and we have Darshan. Darshan is our guest. He's been on our show several times before. He's an attorney specializing in healthcare. Uh, he's a pharmacist. He's an educator. He's an author. And this is the first of what we hope to be monthly appearances by Darshan. And he's going to come here. And I know you know people are very interested in legal, legal topics, legal information because it's very tricky, especially in healthcare. And so, so Darshan hopes to come on and kind of help educate us a little bit more. Not necessarily giving legal advice because he can't do that, but legal tips, legal strategies, maybe just if everyone just gets a tip or two as a takeaway from each time Darshan comes on, I think that will be very successful. And Darshan can also share what he's doing uh, because he's working on lots of projects. So every month when we bring him on, he can kind of share something about what he's working on. So with that being said, Darshan, uh, welcome. Thank you for having me, uh, Dan, Don, when you come on. <laughs> um, thank you for having me, both of you. Um, I'm looking forward to this. This actually seems like a really fun thing to do. There there has been a lot of interest in legal and compliance right now. Um, as you mentioned, um, I do focus on the healthcare area for the most part. Um, I get involved in uh, corporate work, get involved in uh, healthcare compliance, get involved in... Um, as, as I like to refer to it, in the post IND phase of uh, healthcare and pharma, um, I work as a pharmacist, so I actually know exactly what your customer has. And um, I work as an attorney and in quality assurance regulatory affairs, so I know exactly what all those people who are, who are stopping you from doing what you want to do, why they're doing it. So I'm here to, to answer questions. They may not be specific to your situation, so that's where the I can give legal advice comes from. Mm -hmm. But. Um, but we can talk about general stuff and we can talk about general issues that people are facing and what are some strategies to deal with them right yeah general stuff and we you know we try to get into that too and hopefully as as research clinics out there or or researchers out there or just anyone involved in clinical trials um you know as they get used to seeing you come on maybe they can ask questions that we can pass on to you although again they're not it's not advice it's going to be just general like little tips and strategies that may or may not apply to you yeah um, by the way, is, has my screen frozen? Cause I, uh, it's side. frozen, but, uh, you know, we still see your handsome face. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. By the way, uh, Don looks like he's lost some weight there. I'm getting there. I, I've <laughs> taken a new leaf or a new approach to life or should I say an old approach. It used to be an okay. exercise nut. And now I'm trying to get back into it. Okay. Just, it just, it hurts my knees and my joints now. It didn't hurt before. <laughs> it sucks getting old, Donna. I'm feeling you on that one. Oh, tell me about it. <laughs> well, it's happening to all of us. It yeah. is. It is. There's one thing we all uh, have at, at least we're getting sexier, right? There you go. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, your screen is frozen, but you know what? These things tend to come back on uh, just at random times. Yeah. So uh, we'll continue this way if you want. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, you know, I can always send you more pictures or something just to add stuff in. If you yeah, know. we'll add stuff to it. <laughs> like the last I one we did, we spliced. our video wasn't working either. Yeah. Uh, I assume you need to splice this at some point, right? Because we've had a lot of informal conversation in the middle of this. But Yeah, yeah. We'll we'll probably get this uh, some of it edited out. Right, cool. Okay. I'll keep quiet now. You can take over. Okay. <laughs> so anyways, uh, last time, Darshan, I know on Twitter... Well, last time we had a very good conversation about lots of topics. Um, mm -hmm. And I know on Twitter we were talking about something that's very interesting to me, and it's healthcare apps. Mm -hmm. um, and naturally, a lot of people have, you know, I mean, I haven't met anyone who doesn't think they're, they're a good idea and they're inevitable. But a lot of people seem to have legal concerns over the HIPAA, HIPAA issues. Uh huh. Um, I don't know if you can get into that a little bit and kind of, you know, are there some examples of apps out there that are kind of crossing the the boundaries a little bit as far as what what is legal? I to be perfectly honest, I haven't had to deal with apps too much in the recent past. So, um, if you were to tell me, here's something that some people have tried to do, uh, and and they've raised HIPAA concerns, that I could tell you why um, that that might have been a concern. 
Um, however, for the most part, as you know, between HIPAA and high tech, uh, the the biggest concern the government has is that you're transmitting personal information, personal health health information, um, to providers or to people who shouldn't have that information. So when you talk about something like a app that is, um, say, collecting patient data, right? Uh, so that uh, let's let's make up an app just for argument's sake. Let's say there's an app where you put uh, patient you you collect patient data, you give it to patients and say, you know what, download this, put your information in there, we'll add you to our clinical trial database. Um, theoretically, you could argue, who are you when you're, when you're pulling it up? Are you a uh, physician pulling it up, in which case have you protected that information as it's, be- as it's being transmitted to you? Mm. Or are you uh, not doing it for the purposes of healthcare at all? If you're not doing it for the purposes of healthcare at all, why are they giving you that information? So that question suddenly starts snowballing really fast. Uh, someone gives you that information, you put it into a, this healthcare app. How is it being transmitted? Is it coming into, by like, say, a, a secure socket layer, like an SSL type of transmission, or is it uh, not not uh, secure? And if it's not secure, people are accessing it. Um, there are hacking concerns, and that's uh-huh. where the high tech act sort of might be kicking in a little bit. Um, the information has now come to you. What can you do with it? Can you give it to sponsors? Do you have the authorization to do that? Um, if you don't give it to sponsors, what are you collecting? Why are you collecting? Are you go- are you going to sell that information to someone? Why are you collecting it? Is it for the purposes of healthcare? If you say it's not for the purposes of healthcare, but then you use it later on for billing reasons, then you've automatically suggested that it may be for the purposes of healthcare. So you sort of have to worry about that a little bit. Mm-hmm. So, so the issue of a hit by a high tech starts snowballing really fast in the context of clinical trials. So each app will have its own concerns, its own privacy issues, but for the most part, they come out from what are you, why are you collecting the data, how are you collecting the data, and what do you do with the data? Right, I think that's the big issue there as far as these apps are concerned, and that's just something I wanted to start off talking about. Um, we'll, as we get more um, stories you know, from Twitter, we'll share mm-hmm. them on next time you come on. I did get an interesting question, Don, mm-hmm. believe it or not, from a viewer <laughs> out there. Um, okay. they didn't, they had no idea you were going to come on, but it was kind of like a legal question. I just remembered it now. So I could probably ask you, um, who, when a research clinic does a study, when they contract mm-hmm. with a sponsor mm-hmm. and let's say the PI later has a falling out with the clinic and says, you know what, I'm going to call the sponsor, have the study transferred to my name and now they're going to pay me. Is mm-hmm. do, does the PI have a legal right to do that, or since the contract is signed in the clinic's name, um, mm-hmm. does the clinic still own that study? Well, it's, it, typically those those contracts are are tri, uh, partisan tripartite. Contra- yeah. Mm-hmm. The, the the issue is it, it depends. For example, the 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 sponsor could decide in one of two ways. The sponsor has a choice. It doesn't have to go with the PI. The PI may not may have just been incidental to the study. Mm. So um, the the sponsor may say, you know what? I actually want to deal with the site on this one. So sponsor will just replace you with a different um, different PI with a different PI. In fact, that may be even easier because all they could do is take a sub I and make them into a PI. Right. On the other on the other hand, if they go to an, if they decide to go with the PI to a different site, they have to go retrain the entire site make sure they have the right SOPs in place. Uh, the advantage on that front is they've got the right 1572 in place. But that's pretty much the, the primary advantage they may be looking at. Mm. Um, from the standpoint of switching over from the site, the site has most of the source documents. You may also have to worry about the, the first site transferring source documents and other documents to the new site. And how is that transmission going to take place? Have you gotten everything you need? Um, and and those issues suddenly start taking taking place. That's not to say that you couldn't do it. Of course, it happens pretty often, I would imagine. But um, from a from an actual execution standpoint, it, it's probably a bigger excuse my language a pain in the butt to do it in terms of just uh, if you, if you take a PI and follow him, it's probably going to be more difficult for the sponsor than you if know. you decide to change sites. And they know that, right? I mean, the sponsors already know yes. that. And, yes. by, and just something even simple I just thought about, too, if you're dealing with a situation like that and and the site actually owns the facility or, or has access to that facility, they can lock up the uh, physical charts and 
regulatory books and all that information that the uh, sponsor would need to have in order to continue that study. They could, but the sponsor probably has signed an agreement saying that you're going to release that information to them anyways. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think in this case, there was the, the PI. The site had another location, and they were going to move that study there. But the PI, that you know, that distance was too far for the PI. So mm -hmm. the PI wanted to actually take the study back for himself and move it, so, I don't know where, you know, I'm assuming somewhere else. But the question was over who actually owns that contract is, since the site signed for it. Well, technically, no one owns the contract. Okay. It, yeah. it, it's really the sponsor's contract. You're just a service provider. Oh, okay. Um, so, and that's usually how it's phrased. You know, now, the other question is, um, when you start looking at a tri-party agreement, again, it depends on how the agreement is written. Sometimes some sponsors will just have uh, the site sign it with the PI acknowledging it. They will sometimes have two separate contracts, one with the site, one with the PI. Mm -hmm. um, uh, some will have intellectual property being exchanged. Some will say intellectual property is not being exchanged. So all of these will play a pretty valuable part in the decision-making process. So for example, um, I mean, if you'll notice, I don't mention cost as being the primary concern. Mm -hmm. A lot of sponsors just say, we want the study done. We've already agreed to what the cost is going to be. But now when you change sites, you may be exponentially increasing the cost of working with your site. So it may, the sponsor may just say, you know what, if the PI moves, I'm just going to shut the study down at your site if you mm -hmm. aren't a high enough enrolling site. Mm -hmm. So it may be a, a no win for everyone. Right. Uh, but well, thank you for the thank you to our viewer for that question. I, I think it was a month or two ago. These are just an example of real real life issues that research clinics out there are facing on a yeah. daily basis. Yeah. And there's no real. It doesn't seem like there is a right or wrong answer from what I heard from you. It's ultimately up to the sponsor. It it is ultimately up to the sponsor, but it's also patient safety. Where is the patient going to be? Where is the patient going to go? Is the patient willing to travel to the new site? Mm -hmm. If the patient, the new site, does it have the right resources? Yeah, the, the PI is moved, but does he have an MRI machine at the new site? Or is it just right. a doctor's office? Mm -hmm. um, those are all going to be questions that, that decide whether the sponsor wants to deal with the new site. There's a reason they worked with the first site, because they did the initial check. They saw what's already out there, and they, think, they thought that that was appropriate, adequate enough. Sometimes you just have a site, for example, that contracts out MRI machines. And they say, you know what? Um, we don't have the MRI machine, but next door we have a provider that does. So even though we don't have it, we'll subcontract with them and we'll take care of it. But now you move to a site that's 50 miles away, suddenly that MRI machine is not right next door. So how are you going to take care of your patient who's with, right. who's with, the, with you? Right. So, sorry, did I get off track there? No, 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 no. no. That, no, no. That's all good information. Uh, the, the other thing I wanted to comment earlier when we were talking about um, these healthcare apps and everything, I, you know, it's it's interesting that it's become such a, a, a major issue because even when you go back to doctor's offices with just physical records, you mm -hmm. are still at risk that, that a lot of that information being seen by people that are not authorized to see it or even getting hold mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. uh, I've heard stories of, of actual patients slipping in doctor's office and stealing things out of their charts for their own personal reasons. Right. Um, I, I think no matter what you do, there's always some kind of risk. Uh, sure. I guess it would come down as, is that a bigger risk transferring information via, you know, the electronic system? It's, there are a couple of things. Number one, uh, Don, you're absolutely correct that risk existed, but number one, um, HIPAA in its various forms was not applicable at that time, depending on when you saw it. HIPAA is over a decade old, but you may have seen it before that decade. Also, high tech, I think, kicked in about 2009. Mm -hmm. So those, con uh, those concerns weren't valid. The second portion of it is, have you taken adequate uh, precautions? And um, so let's say you have, you've taken the adequate precautions, even if you have an SSL uh, method of transmitting the information, that doesn't mean it's completely unhackable. It just means you've taken what the reasonable precautions to make sure that the data doesn't get violated or doesn't get um, uh, retransmitted in the wrong place. Yeah, um, yeah. And that could be the same then uh, analogy with someone that has physical files at a, at a physical location. Yep, You've right. taken the proper steps to put an alarm and make sure the doors are locked and everyone signs the forms to make sure that right. they're the only ones that are able to view this information. But you still have the risk of somebody, you know, just 
disalarming your system and breaking into your office to steal files and information. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. This, this right reminds right. me of. Uh... Do you watch Boston Legal, Darshan? <laughs> I used to. It's been a while. What's up? Uh, I watched the one episode where there's, um, you know, they're defending an insur- health insurance company who put mm-hmm. on a website, right? And this was like 2005, so like websites were still kind of, you know. Cool. Yeah, kind of cool. <laughs> uh, and so the insurance company, you know, had, they followed the legal requirements for protecting mm-hmm. people's information. But they knew that hackers could still get in. But they said as long as, you know, I mean, they were legally did. Um, they did what they were supposed to do. Well, it turns out there was some kind of divorce. And one patient who signed up with uh, this wife who signed up with that health insurance plan, her ex-husband, he was a psycho. He kind of found out where she was seeing her psychiatrist and on what days. So he waited for her there and then ended up murdering her. So they were suing the insurance company for not not doing more than the bare mm-hmm. minimum for uh, mm-hmm. protecting their their customers' information, which I thought was a fantastic uh, episode for those of you Boston legal fans out there. <laughs> um, it very well could have been. Now, the, the issue you raised was they knew of a specific area they could have focused on that they knew that they were lacking in, and that, that may very well be an area that you could go after them for. But... If the, in the event you actually don't know about a specific area that needs focus, and you're sort of saying, we've taken all reasonable steps, um, we, we spent a lot of money, we've taken all the steps we possibly can, um, and, and yet there are ways people get in, a court's going to say, you know what, there, there's only so much you can do. Now, on the other hand, if you have uh, a situation where they, sh- they should have known better, and they knew everything that was covered, and they'd taken all the ru- – they'd taken – they'd been cheap, if you will that's when you open yourself up to potential lawsuits. Even if, even though they're following all the legal requirements? See, the thing is, legal requirements are never written, out, written down the way regs are written out. Regs oh, okay. will say something as specific as, you need to have X, Y, Z in place. So the, the regs might say you need to have a closed door. Mm-hmm. But r- laws will say you need to have a secure location. What does the word secure location mean? Secure location right. could mean a closed door. It could mean access is limited. It could mean anything. So you don't... It's difficult to tell if, and this is just a generalization, obviously, but it's difficult to tell if you've met all legal requirement, re- requirements. With regulations, sometimes a lot clearer. With guidances, it's even more clear. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Makes sense? Yeah, yeah very much it so. Does. Now, I remember we were talking last time. You- we- hey, Darshan, welcome back. We had some technical difficulties. Now, I did wanted to get into one last question here as we wrap up. Uh, It's in regards to, again, it's reflective of the times we're in. Uh, During these last few years, a lot of research sites, you know, I mean, it's no surprise and and it's no secret. They've been having financial problems um, due to the lack of activity over the last few years of studies. And it looks like that's starting to change course. Thankfully, there's lots of studies coming out now. But because of that, a lot of sites are using up what little cash they had to ramp up for this busy you know, period of time we're in right now. So mm-hmm. w- what advice can you give to, not advice, what tips can you give <laughs> to a research okay. clinic out there? It's funny how one word can change the meaning of, the legal meaning <laughs> of a question. Uh, right. What what tips or strategies would you possibly recommend to a research clinic who's really tight on cash um, and but is doing very well on numerous studies with their sponsors? But they just can't afford to wait another 60 days to get their payments. They may have to shut their doors down. Um, and so it, that seems like a lose-lose because obviously the, the sponsor wants that data. The site's obviously doing well. And the research site doesn't want to shut down because they're going to have a pretty good year. So what, you know, what can they do as far as their contracts are concerned? Can they get an advance? What, what kind of things can, they, can the research site do? I mean, there, there are a couple of different options when you're dealing with it. And in fact, I had a potential client who brought this question up to me recently, and, and we had a pretty interesting discussion on exactly this topic. Um, the, the, the big question, there are a couple of options. Number one, you could talk to your local bank, see if you have a good relationship with them, if you've done business with them for a long time. You might be able to say, look, here, we have already completed this work. This is a receivable from the sponsor company. Can you give me... 
um, this money up front and I will pay you back when I get the money. Um, a bank will say, okay, mm -hmm. here's the interest rate that, that will uh, charge you and, um, and will basically do a rotating type of account with you where they'll uh, give you cash up front and you pay them back. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a kind of rotating loan, a revolving loan, if you will. Um, option number two, you go talk to your friendly neighborhood investor and say, look, <laughs> I need cash. I need uh, capital. Um, here's here's the bottom line. Here's the money that I already have. Here is where there's a list of um, potential clients. Here's a list of uh, clients that are already signed up with me. Here's the trajectory mm -hmm. we're projecting. Basically, you're looking at getting in a new partner. Mm -hmm. um, so we considered an equity route. We considered a loan route. There's a third option, which is a little trickier. Um, which is you go to the sponsor. It, this completely depends on your relationship with, with the sponsor, your relationship and your behavior during this uh, during the study. If you have a great relationship with the sponsor, you've been a great producing site, and the sponsor wants you to continue, you may be able to talk to the sponsor and say, "Look, here is the situation right now. We want to continue. We've got the patients. We can keep getting them in, but your payment terms are just not meeting my requirements. Can you cut my uh, cut your cut your payment terms from?" 90 days to 30 days. They might push back, um, but you might get lucky every so often. Mm -hmm. Let's say you can't change the payment terms like that. You say, you know what? I recognize that you don't want to give me the money yet. You, you want to be sure that, um, uh, well, you could also have, do an advanced type of situation. Uh, can you still hear me? Oh, yes. yeah. Because yeah. Uh -huh. okay. um, I got a message saying the connection's too slow. Yeah, so. that's Skype. We got to thank Microsoft for that. <laughs> um, so yeah, the, you, you could go to the sponsor, ask for a loan as well. Um, sponsors are very, very hesitant to give you a loan or an upfront payment on um, on your on the work you you're about to do. The exception to that being something like startup costs. So if this the, this is a first time study that you're starting up, they may be more eager to help you than. Um, well, let me rephrase that. If this is a study you're doing with the uh, with the sponsor. You've had a great history with them. You know you're going to be able to produce the results that they want. Well, not the results that, you, that they want, but the, you can bring in the right set of patients for them. Um, sponsors are more willing to work with you. Um, on the other hand, if you um, – so in, in those situations, they may be willing to give you a startup payment, if you will. Um, on the other hand, once you start the study, it's going to be difficult for you to ask for a startup payment or a uh, advance because sponsors are going to say, "Well, what am I paying you for?" Um, <laughs> a lot of there are significant compliance concerns that come into place because you have to start worrying about um, why is that payment being made? Is there a potential for either a bribe or a false claim or something like that? Yeah. So, so sponsors worry about that a lot. So um, they may not want to go down that route. Um, another option to consider is um, basically talking to the sponsor saying, you don't have to pay me. However, I want the ability to pull that cash out as soon as we deliver the, the receivables to you guys. So you could set up what's referred to an, as an escrow account. Mm -hmm. um, that seems like a really foreign term. But for any one of you who's actually bought a house, an escrow is what you pay. It's basically when you're buying a house. You go to the seller and say, look, I'm the buyer. You're the seller. I really like your house, but the roof is broken. I need to fix the roof. The seller will say, give me my money. I will keep $10,000 in escrow. Uh, and once you finish fixing the, the roof, give me the bill. I'll release the money from escrow. You can have it to use hmm. uh, to pay back for what you're doing. You, you use the same concept. You go to your sponsor and say, I will do the results. You aren't paying me. It will remain with a third party. It's not my money. It's not, it's not your money either. It belongs to a third party until I deliver on my receivables. Once you confirm that your receivables have been quote-unquote received, then I have the right to pull out the money from the escrow. That stops the, uh, the rotation of money and it, it helps you with uh, cash flow issues. Um, so that might be an alternative way to... To address, to address some cash flow concerns. Um, but yeah, those are some of the ways you could deal with them. That's not to say there aren't others, but these are the primary ways that come to mind. And these are very creative um, strategies that research clinics may not know about, and which is good. Uh, I think I'll title this video, um, <laughs> you know, just to get as many views as we can. Um, can you start an escrow with your sponsor? I think a lot of sites will click on that. 
How about uh, a, a different way? Five ways to increase cash flow to a clinical trial site. Oh, fantastic. Even better, Darshan. Yeah. You're a natural born marketer. Yeah, the, word cash, <laughs> the word cash flow creates uh, some attention. Exactly. Anything with cash or money. Yeah. Uh, well, Darshan, thank you very much for coming on today. And like I said, for those of you watching, we're going to try to do this every month where we get different topics, maybe three to five questions. We encourage you guys to send us questions that you may have for Darshan for when he's on. If you want, if you can't wait a month and you need to ask Darshan yourself, Darshan, you have a Twitter, right? Yep, I'm at FDA Lawyers, or you can uh, re uh, reach me. I, I work in a law firm. Uh, at, you can reach me at Darshan D A R S H A N at Conform Law. That's C O N F O R M Law dot com. Obviously, if it's a question that's just a general question, I uh, I'm not going to be answering your specific question. We aren't setting up an attorney-client relationship. Uh, based on those questions. However, uh, I'd be happy to just have a conversation with you, tell you more about what I do, and see if there are some specific areas I might be able to help you with. Um, the the other alternative is, is just talk to Dan, and uh, we'd be happy to schedule extra meetings so that we can address more que questions if they come up. Yeah, we can do that. We, uh, we're going to try a minimum once a month, and if we get a huge outpouring of questions, which is what we hope for, then we'll have you right. come on much more, Darshan. So that sounds perfect. Thank you as always. And uh, we'll have thank links you. to all of Darshan's sites and Twitters um, on this blog post. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It's Dan and Don and Darshan from theclinicaltrialsguru.com. Thanks a lot. We're the 3Ds, aren't we? <laughs> <Yep>. See ya. <laughs> See ya. <laughs>